Here on the Bay of Fundy, the tides are larger than anywhere else in the world. This twice daily rise and fall of the shoreline is infused into the rhythm of daily life. According to the legends of the Mi'kmaq First Nations, who have known the Bay of Fundy longer than anyone, the tides began long ago with the angry thrashings of a great whale's tail. Scientists, on the other hand, look to other colossal bodies to explain the tides. Let's let our local scientist and our lunch explain. Now, this is a vastly simplified model, but imagine that this cantaloupe is the Earth. Let's add the ocean, represented by these blue whale gummies. And this circle of cheese, the moon. The moon exerts a gravitational pull on the Earth, here shown by spaghetti sticks. It pulls most strongly on whatever is closest to it. Hence, the water here bulges up. On the opposite side of the Earth, a second bulge forms. As this water is the point furthest from the Moon, it experiences less gravitational pull than the solid Earth. So, the Earth is actually pulled towards the Sun, leaving behind this bulge of water. Let's say that this octopus is us, here at the Bay of Fundy. When we are near the bulge, we would experience high tide. As the Earth revolves 360 degrees in one day, we would rotate into a period of low tide, then a second tidal cycle of high tide and low tide. While tides are fairly predictable, they do come a little later each day. This is again all on account of that moon. As the moon makes its monthly rotation around the Earth, each day the moon will travel to a slightly different position relative to the Earth, creating a daily delay in the tides by about an hour. And why should the tides vary in height each day? Because the sun must also be considered. Although the sun is much bigger than the moon, it is also much further away, so its gravitational influence on the tides is less than the moon's. When the sun and the moon are in line, the gravitational pulls combine to make greater tides, called spring tides. When the sun is at a right angle to the moon, the gravitational pulls compete, which produces smaller tides, called neap tides. And so the tides are created by extraterrestrial forces. But this simple model is far from complete, and many other factors, such as physical conditions and weather, also influence the strength and timing of the tides. In fact, to find out why the Bay of Fundy has such large tides, we need to investigate closer. The name Fundy is speculated to come from the French word fondu, meaning split, or the Portuguese word fondo, meaning funnel. And it is the bay's funnel shape that allows it to produce such large tides. During incoming tide, the water flows towards the head of the bay and is funneled into an increasingly narrow and shallow area. The large amount of water has nowhere to go but up. These large tides produce powerful tidal currents that churn up vast amounts of water and nutrients, creating the conditions for one of the world's most productive aquatic ecosystems. And this region must be productive to support such a diversity of animals. This diversity starts right at the shore. It is here in the intertidal zone, the area between high tide and low tide, that some of the world's most adaptable creatures live. Here's our local scientist again to give us a tour of the shoreline. Imagine if your house was underwater for half the day, or imagine withstanding the freezing air of January nights and scorching summer days. These are just a few of the challenges faced by the hardy creatures in the intertidal zone. The solution for many tidal animals is that during low tide they close up or hide under seaweed and rocks. So while the intertidal zone might seem barren at first, hidden away, 
the shore is alive with a startling amount of biodiversity, which increases as we venture closer to the water. At the highest point of the intertidal zone, the land is rarely in contact with the water, only the occasional spray from a storm. Here, the rocks are covered by one of the oldest living organisms, lichen, which forms a hard coating like dull black paint. Lichens are part fungi and part algae, and grow very slowly in harsh environments where other organisms can't. Lichen feed the periwinkles and limpets that dominate the upper shore. Like a little submarine hatch, the operculum on a periwinkle's foot seals the creature tightly in its shell, protecting it from drying out. As we venture lower down the shore, to the middle shore, the area is now inundated by water twice a day. Pounding waves and currents are a serious challenge for animals in this area. Barnacles attach themselves firmly to rocks. Out of the water, they can appear like nothing more than mineral buildup. But these animals are actually related to crabs. And when the water comes up, these barnacles come out to feed. The middle intertidal zone is also home to seaweeds like knotted rack and rockweed. During low tide, they retain moisture and help crabs and sea stars from drying out. When the water rises, they are lifted vertically by their floating bladders, enabling them to get the sunlight necessary for photosynthesis. In tide pools, water can become deoxygenated when it sits stagnant in the sun for hours. Seaweeds make life in tidal pools possible by photosynthesizing and putting oxygen back in the water. Further down, and the shore is only exposed during very low tides, short tufts of red Irish moss cover the rocks, creating an environment for sea stars and sea urchins. Finally, the subtidal zone is almost always covered with water. Biodiversity is greatest here since the creatures do not need to tolerate a large variety of conditions as the marine life in the upper shore. Here, anemones, sea slugs, rock crabs and many other creatures thrive. Unlike in the upper and middle shore, where a hard shell to protect from moisture loss and pounding waves is necessary, here in the lower shore, soft-bodied animals such as sea peaches and sea cucumbers flourish. However, in exchange for the more favourable living conditions, the creatures need to compete with one another for food and space. And the Bay of Fundy's intertidal zone is just one part of a larger marine and terrestrial ecosystem. Think about the places I go Think about the folks I know Fear the earth with my toes And I breathe the earth through my nose and With my eyes I've come to see That I am wild and I am free Cross the lake that ripples wide The unforgiving sun that shines when the water hits the shore, the rocks provide a crooked floor. And like the fishes underneath, oh, I swim wild and I swim free. Many birds come to feed on the coast. The seaweed beds of the lower intertidal zone act as nurseries for fish and juvenile lobsters that in turn feed animals in the open ocean. And erosion caused by the tides provides nutrients for plankton which in turn nourish the world's largest mammals. And don't forget that you are part of this ecosystem too. The balance between human needs and the ocean's resilience is a delicate one. In the 10 minutes that you have watched this film, celestial bodies have rotated, 
the water has risen and this dynamic environment continues to change. <laughs>